up today for our hearing and our learning. Uh, it is indeed a very important uh, kind of, at least for me, another way of grounding what I believe we are called to be and how we are called to be and, and what we are called to be in this time and in this season uh, of great tumult. I hope that we all appreciate uh, that uh, the world is, is, is a little in trouble right now, praise God. We have um, all kinds of things that are happening both uh, domestically and abroad. Uh, we have rogue nations from Israel to Russia to, you know, I don't think China is as rogue as folk would like to make us think, but folks are popping off with all kind of bombs and everybody's nuclear uh, capable and, and the, the Middle East is uh, just beyond uh, comprehension the level of mass killing that is happening there uh, in uh, not only the Holy Land but extended to Lebanon and in, in, in uh, parts of uh, Iran and folks are just really uh, creating a very tenuous uh, geopolitical environment and uh, I was reminded as I read this passage uh, in preparation for today, the scriptures say, Jesus said actually, uh, that when you hear wars and rumors of wars, you must look up for your redemption is drawing nigh. And there are many people who uh, only interpret that to mean that uh, the parousia, the second coming of Jesus is coming. And uh, I, I pray the Lord come quickly. I was joking with my father, uh, you know, when I grew up in the church, you know, we was convinced the rapture would have happened already. Praise God. We, we, you know, at least twice. Praise God. I mean, the way they had us worried about the rapture. I, I was figuring, man, I'd at least be caught up twice by now. I'm 49. Praise God. And my dad said, oh, son, just keep on living. Amen. And we're going to do that. But how many of you know that uh, redemption drawing nigh is just not talking about the great escape, the great taking away or the return of Jesus and the church being uh, uh, gathered with Jesus in eternity. But it is also talking about uh, you and I and we have a higher source that we can uh, literally appeal to, reflect on, uh, keep our eyes fixed to. And that's what our sermon will be a little bit about today. Uh, this passage of scripture, I think, is a wonderful uh, offering for us. And we'll jump into the text. Hebrews is uh, a, a text that is likely written uh, in the back half of the first century. So it's, you know, likely a full generation after the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but people certainly would have been familiar with Jesus and the narratives, the stories, the testimonies, the eyewitness testimonies. It's likely written to an audience of folks who may uh, be particularly uh, Jewish in their orientation, which just means that they had a deep sense of not just the Messiah, but also had a deep sense of the theological kind of assumptions of the Torah, the the, the what we call the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, they had this expectation that there is a promise God made to God's people and they are literally living in a moment, a season, where not only is the Roman Empire and the whole kind of their geopolitical context is upside down, but they're likely trying to figure out Man, what, what is it about uh, my way of life as a follower of Jesus? What does that mean for me living in this context? And I would argue that it is a very similar, at least it resonates with me, that we are followers of Jesus. We are attending to and attempting to uh, be faithful to the ways of Jesus in a context where the world feels like it is fraying in many different directions. And so I find this text to be helpful uh, for lots of reasons, at least I hope it will uh, for us as we preach and teach. We're going to read uh, the first four verses of chapter one, and then we'll jump to chapter number two and read five or six verses uh, in uh, chapter two. This is how the writers of the Hebrews uh, text uh, speaks and captures uh, some divinely inspired words to the people, the readers of their day. And they start off by telling the story of God's activity among the world, among creation, among the people. Verse number one, the scripture says, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many 
and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, somebody say the last days, the last days. God has spoken to us by a son whom God appointed heir of all things, through whom God also created the world. This is uh, one of the most kind of theologically rich scriptures of, that speak to uh, the claim that Jesus and the Father, God, if you will, have this constitution, this eternal constitution that in our tradition we call the Trinity, the Godhead, and they were and have at all times existed together. When you think of the historical arguments of Christian faith, you'll find folks referring to bedrock passages that try to help explain the claim of Jesus, who would describe himself as one with God, not like uh, metaphorically, but literally. At least it was so offensive, his claim, that that's part of how they made an argument to kill Jesus. Amen. And so, you know, how many know you don't die for metaphors? <laughs> Amen. It's, you know, metaphors. You know, oh, he's just speaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, with a simile and a metaphor. You know, get a rope. No, there's, there, there's a claim that offends the senses. Right. And the power and authority of which Jesus was making these claims were upsetting the status quo of both the religious life of some of these Jewish scholars. But also it was upsetting what I would argue the socio-political life, because there's much at stake if it is true that the life of Jesus is more than just a metaphor of the eternal uncreated one. Verse number three, Jesus, he goes on to say, is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. And Jesus sustains all things by his powerful word. So again, I ain't talking about no metaphor. Like this, this is the real deal, Amen. right? When he had made purifications for sins. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name Jesus has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Simply just saying that the work, the life, the authority, the power of Jesus separates him from both prophets and angels. There are some who just like to reduce Jesus. Oh, he was a nice prophet. Well, you know, you can say that. You can say, you know, it's raining outside right now, too. <laughs> Amen. But by Jesus' own description, by the earliest accounts of the Christian faith, there is this declaration that Jesus, as we would say in some of our theological doctrines, is the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily. That as much of God's eternal existence, you can squeeze into a physical body and the body not just disintegrate because it's just, you know, too much. It is the fullness of God. It lacks nothing. It is all in all God in a body. It is not like us today where we say, I am a God. We're all divine beings. You may be divine, but you're not what this is saying. Because <laughs> I ain't seen you raise no dead folk yet. So you know, I ain't seen you walk on water. We can try it. There's a beach right down the street. <laughs> How you know the claim of Jesus? It's very different than some of these new age claims we're making today. I know it makes us feel good. It's a you know effort to build up our self-esteem, help us get in touch with our inner power. But how you know what Jesus is claiming, what's being claimed about Jesus is altogether different. And again, that's why they put him on the cross. Because uh -huh. mm -hmm. if Jesus really is God, he's higher than Caesar. He's higher than the president. He's higher than your favorite philosopher. He sustains the world. That's, some, that's, that's quite a claim. Having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Verse number five in chapter two. So now God did not subject the coming world. Listen to this. The world that is to come. How many of you know that one of the great claims 
of the God of the universe in our tradition is that God knows everything. Now, it's troubling that God knows everything, that God sees all and has all power, and we see all the, the, the wickedness in the world. The, the claim of God's omniscience, the claim of God's omnipresence, the claim of God's omnipower, that God is all in all, God knows everything, bumps up against our limited knowledge, our limited scope. Anybody ever been... Uh, 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 I was driving in the car with some folks yesterday, and, and, and I, you know, in Oakland, various parts of Oakland, even when the light turns green, you better look both ways. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Somebody say amen, because some folk, some folk colorblind, and they think red is yellow, and yellow is green, and, and you be out there in the middle of the intersection, toe up, talking about, I had the light. Mm. I'm here to tell you. So, you know, I'm in, you know, getting ready to go, and I see something flash out the corner of my eye. And I hit my brakes, and it was nothing. And it caused me to think about how even when I use the gift of my peripheral vision, I still can't see it all right 100% of the time. God has the sense of eternity in God's mind. And the coming world, the angels, God's emissaries, God's actors, sometimes you and me, cannot see the whole. It is not subject to us. It is not within our power. It is not within our reach. And yet, God allows us to still participate with God in the unfolding of history. The writer evokes a passage, I believe, out of Psalms number eight. Someone has testified somewhere in verse number six, what are humans that you are mindful of them or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor subjecting all things under their feet. Writers, again, appealing to a very Jewish text because the readers would be familiar with these psalms. That's the psalm. Remember we talked about the psalms a couple weeks ago, how these are prayers, they're songs that people would regularly sing. They internalize. I don't mean to editorialize too much because I don't want to be up here too long, but I was at my brother's uh, last week. I couldn't make it back in time for church, uh, and I thank God for Pastor Tanisha. Hey, she all right. And so... And so my brother got ordained a bishop last week uh, in, in, in his church, and it was, you know, a great time for our family. And so, you know, we were singing a song called Glory to His Name. And some of y'all don't know that song. It's an old school hymn. Uh, down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of life, singing glory to his name. Now, because I, I, we don't have enough time, but I want you to trip off this. <laughs> I was tripping off this while I was sitting with some of our family friends. That verse has four, that song has four verses. And of course, I just sang the first verse. I haven't sang that song in about 20 years. We sitting there singing, and I wasn't even trying to recall. All the verses, they were just rolling out, my, rolling out my tongue. You know, just verse number two, verse number three, verse number four. And even right now, I probably couldn't pull it out because, you know, I'm not in a groove. <laughs> but it is so interesting how something can be so internalized that you can pull it out of you when you need to. I wonder if we ever got Jesus so internalized. Even when you ain't trying to pull Jesus out, Jesus just coming out of you, just coming, coming out of you. Because there's something about the internalization of God. Even in all circumstances, God finds a way to break through our consciousness. 
You've made them a little lower than the angels. You've crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Verse number eight, now in subjecting all things to them. Talking again about the angels, perhaps about, you know, creation, humans. God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus. Lord, I, 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 did, I, did I underline that? Yeah. I felt that thing just smack me upside the head. With all the things that are going on that we cannot control, that you cannot predict, that is within your capacity to fix, but yet outside the reach of you to fully actualize. It is not to suggest that everything in your life, our lives, will go well or right. But it is to declare that even though there are things that are not yet subject to us, we do see Jesus. Lord, have mercy. Who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, Jesus might taste death for everyone. <laughs> I could do a Bible study on this thing right here. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, is bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them us, we brothers and sisters saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. It's preaching from the title today, I See Jesus. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and let the preaching and teaching of your word be made easy through your anointing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, we pray. Let all the people of the way say amen. amen. Maybe I'll add that do in there. Come on, somebody say, I do see Jesus. Do. You know, that do makes all the difference in the world because it is signaling intent. I see Jesus speaks to inevitability. And I think it is inevitable that you and I will see Jesus from time to time without our effort. Because Jesus knows how to show up. God knows how to appear. There's all these records in history that talk about the appearance of God. They call them epiphanies. Anybody ever said I had an epiphany? I had a light come on. But when you add the word do, I want to suggest to you that it is speaking to intentionality. It is not that I am waiting for the inevitability of God's appearance. It is declaring that in the midst of my reality, I do, I will, I must see Jesus. How many know that it makes a difference when you are doing the work? To see Jesus. And I'm not talking about here at church. I mean, you know, we can do all kind of tricks up in here at church and give you the kind of space to see Jesus. The music can be gone. The preacher can be good. The love among the fellowship could be wonderful. But how many of you know the most important time for you to do the work to see Jesus is outside? A Sunday service. It is outside the context of being among the fellowship of believers. 
You and I must do the work to see Jesus everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that you and I must act in a way where people who are looking for Jesus can see Jesus everywhere. Like, everywhere you go. <laughs> you know, like there's some people out here who feel like, oh, I see Jesus in the trees and the clouds and, and the water. And that's great because God is in that too. There's a wonderful writer called Brother Lawrence. He's a mystic. I love Lawrence. He's one of these folk, I think, 13th century. And I love the mystics. I, you know, I was a time I used to think I was going to be a monk. I was going to sit up out on a rock and just meditate and read books and write. And then they told me I couldn't watch, you know, Kobe. And, you know, I couldn't watch, you know, it's, it's all this ascetic stuff. It, it's a little too extreme. But I do have a love for the ascetic life, for the mystics of our faith. People who have committed their whole life to doing the work to see Jesus in every moment, every breath, every circumstance. How many of you know that our lives are often too filled with the opposite of God? That often Jesus can be left out of our calculations. Somebody say amen. amen. I mean, you got to be honest with yourself. At least I try to be honest with myself. There are moments in my day where I have to remind myself. I follow Jesus. <laughs> I don't follow Lucifer, Beelzebub, Satan, the devil. Because you trying to bring that out of me. Vipers and snakes. and. <clears throat> I have to ask, I have to remind myself, I'm supposed to follow Jesus. Brother Lawrence has this wonderful practice. It is called practicing the presence of God. It is an act. You should Google it if you have time. It is the act of consistently seeing within my daily activities, God's presence is here. Huh, I believe it's. The Pauline writer, maybe it's first Peter, it says that in everything that I do, I do it as unto the Lord. Yeah. There is no wasted action in my walk, yeah. in my daily life. I love some of the kind of Native American uh, 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 religious sensibilities, particularly when it comes to uh, the issue of addressing harm in communities. If you talk to native uh, cultural folks, uh, they, they talk about how they don't throw people away. They don't throw anything away. They literally recycle everything. There is nothing that gets wasted in the economy of God. Wouldn't it be something if you and I leaned into this idea that there's no wasted moments in my day? where I won't find Jesus. Brother Lawrence, he says it like this, four ways that he uh, you know, summarizes the presence of God, practicing the presence of God, seeking to see others through the eyes of God. Whew. That's, that's how you learn how to pray for your enemies to fail, you know, they schemes, but you don't want them to die. Why? Because you're seeing them through the eyes of God. The people you like, the people you don't like, your children, your boss, the Republicans, the MAGA people, the authoritarians, the IDF, the terrorists, all these people, I got to learn to see them through the eyes of God. I believe God's heart breaks at the wickedness of humanity at our inhumanity to one another. So seeing that through the eyes of God does not mean I do not become overwhelmed with grief and anger and sadness, but it does mean that I do not seek their death. I gotta tell you, beloved, that's a hard thing. I mean, I know not very many of us in here uh, are thirsty for blood, but we wish it. <laughs> I want you to understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It is so fascinating to me the number of people who love to attribute 
the death of people to God's judgment. And yet, most people who die don't die by God striking them down with lightning. They die at the hands of another created being. And so unless you think God is using you as God's death angel, mm -hmm, I'm going to keep going. That was my first, how do you practice the presence of God? Second, stopping throughout the day to listen to God. So I see others through God's eyes, and then I stop throughout my day to listen to God. I'm taking on God's eyes. I'm also listening to God. Just practicing the presence of God. Just giving you a few notes. Carrying or placing symbols in your office and home that remind you of God's presence. One of the great practices of the early church was to have iconography, I iconographs. Iconography, <laughs> Jesus, I C O N O G R A P H Y. <laughs> Icons. They are reminders. So when you go throughout the day and you forget, you can get catalyzed to remember. God is present. If the only thing on your desk is Diddy, pause. The beehive, we'll see. Your favorite politician, your favorite sports person, and that's all the icons you have around you. You better have the word of God hidden in your heart. Most of us don't. Like we don't we don't know scriptures. I'm not. It's no shade. You know, if I asked you to quote ten scriptures and your life depended on it, you'd be like, Jesus wept. <laughs> um, for, oh, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, have everlasting life. Um, how many was that? That was just two. But I asked you to give me, you know, somebody's stats. Oh, 35 points a game, 10 rebounds, 7 assists, 58% uh, shooting, uh, and, you know, 2.1 steals a game. Mm-hmm. You see, tell me, oh, Pastor, my, my mind don't work that way. I can't memorize scripture, but you can memorize everything else <laughs> the icons are important i think this week you ought to find some icons they got to be like you walking down the street carrying a cross this is my icon <laughs> wouldn't it be something just to put an icon and you should look up christian icons it's fascinating a lot of them are really cool they deep they they, they stylish you know even if he's trying to hide it'd be like oh that's dope that's a cross. That's not a, what's that bracelet with the cross and it costs like $1,000 with a thing of Chanel or something. They wear it around their thing. It's got gold and look expensive. I don't know if that's reminding you of the Lord or not. <laughs> but it could, it could. <laughs> Get an icon and then using breath prayer. Every time you breathe, you're remembering God is present. You are the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. You are my daily bread. Just giving you some practicing of the presence of God. Why is that important? Because if we do not practice the presence of God, it becomes difficult to see Jesus everywhere. Because evil is real. Wickedness is real. Struggle and strife is real. And many of us are on a journey to be like Jesus. We are being transformed into the image of God. I mean, we're not there yet. The greatest Methodist, uh, we, we, you know, we have Pentecostal sensibilities here in our congregation, and I am deeply informed by the Methodist tradition, which just means that we have, or I, 
assume in my preaching you'll hear these themes. You may not know it, but we talk about sanctification, the continuous, ongoing, transforming of our being and our person into the image and likeness of God. God has put a thumbprint in us that is God's image, which just means that within every one of us, God has an imprint of God's very being, God's essence inside of us. That is why you and I must struggle and strive to love everybody. Because when you hate your brother, your sister, you are hating the image of God in them. And hatred, when taken to its fullest form, results in death. It results in dehumanization. It results in you not caring that 40,000 Palestinians have been killed. You not caring that the Congo and the Sudan is on fire. You not caring that our unhoused loved ones right here in the Bay Area continue to live in squalor while we are in the richest region of the world. Because we've been trained to not see Jesus in those we know and don't know. But when I realize that even my worst enemy has the image of the divine in them, I train my eyes to find God. I train my heart to love the unlovable. Unless you think that you used to not be unlovable. I know some of you think you was the stuff since you got here. But do I have an honest person in the house that said, there's some seasons of my life where I was unlovable to somebody. I was not worthy of the extension of love. I was a rebel with a cause. I was a piece of work. I was caught up in my struggles, my addictions, my trauma, my wickedness, my anger. And for somebody I was not lovable, but God loved me back to life. Lord have mercy. And so this is what Brother Lawrence says, the most holy, listen to this, I have a quote, please put the quote up. The most holy and necessary practice of our spiritual life is the presence of God. That means finding constant pleasure in God's divine company. <laughs> so I say constant. constant. Without a break. It is continuous. God, I will find pleasure in your presence. If you are everywhere, that means there is never a time in my life where you and I will not have the opportunity to experience pleasure. I find strength. I find grace. I find hope. I find love. I find peace of mind in the company of God. Lord, help me to preach and give your neighbor a high five and tell him I'm in the company of God. I, I got to stay where God is. Now, this gets to the, 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 the whole point of our sacramental Sunday. Sacramental, not sacramental. Mm -hmm. Sacraments are an important consistency in the life of the church. It is just a word that is used to describe that at every moment in the life of the church, God is collapsing barriers between the sacred and the secular, the holy and the profane, the material and the supernatural, the divine and the human. God is collapsing that which we have sought to distinguish one from another. And the sacraments remind us that with the power of God's spirit, grace can be transmitted to us. Supernatural strength <laughs> can be transmitted to you and I, which just means that God, if I can lean into your collapsing work, Lord, I feel a preach coming on in here today. Then I can find grace I didn't know I had. And I can find grace that I didn't know I needed. Anybody, anybody, anybody ever stumbled into some grace you didn't know you needed? I'm not talking about what you think. Oh, you know, I got enough grace for today. 
<laughs> and then you stumble into a situation and you realize, God, I need some old grace. You don't got to come back to the church house or call the preacher to get the grace you need because God knows how to extend you supernatural grace for the facing of this hour. And I'm here to tell you, beloved, some of us need to train ourselves through the practice of the sacraments. That is why baptism, a sacrament, communion, a sacrament. That is the extent of the sacraments in the Christian, well, not say Christian, in the Protestant tradition. But if you go all the way into the Catholic Orthodox tradition, they got seven sacraments. And I like the way they structure this. You know, I, I, I am someone who affirms that Catholic Christianity is a part of our tradition. So I'm not one of these people to feel like you a heretic. No, how many of you know much of what we hold to be true was preserved through these traditions? Amen. So go talk to God about it. Don't come talking to me. <laughs> the sacraments of the church, listen to this, Christian initiation, baptism, confirmation. Why confirmation? Because there is the practice in the earliest of the tradition that children would be baptized. Not necessarily with their will, but as a practice of initiation. And then at a certain age, they would make a confirmation. I confirm the act of baptism that commits me to this tradition. I confirm it at an age where I can make a decision. Or you can reject it and say, I know I was baptized as a Christian, but I'm not, I'm not cool with that. I don't want to be no Christian. But it is still a sacramental moment. When one goes through confirmation. How many know it's good for some of us to confirm our faith yes, from time to time? Yes. It's good for some of us to reconfirm yes. our faith. How many ever had a moment where your faith got weak? Yes. <laughs> you walked away from that faith. You said, I don't know about this faith. I'm going to go try some other things. <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, experiment. I'm going to reject it. That's fine. You can reject God. But how many know God can't reject you? You can do anything you want. God, I'm walking away from you, but God has a hook in your mouth. <laughs> you only get so far. How many glad that you can only get so far from God? Lord, help me in here. I thought I was on my way running, and God said, uh, <laughs> don't you go too far, McBride, because I got something for you to do that only works with my hand on your life. And I want you to know, beloved, that God's hand is on your life. You may think God's hand is gone. God's hand is present. You don't even know it yet. Some of you getting baptized today, you think it's because it's your mama's birthday. <laughs> you think because you got an invitation from a friend. Some of you here take communion. Oh, it's just what we do on the first Sunday. No, this is a sacramental moment where God is going to infuse you with grace you didn't know you needed. Some of you need healing. God says sacramental moments are coming. Some of you need strength. Sacramental moments are coming. Some of you need power. Sacramental moments are coming. Something different than just you just praying a prayer. Oh, God, help me. Sacraments denote that the incarnation never stops happening. That God being made flesh never stops happening. That the divine collapsing into the secular never stops happening. Why? Because it's happening in you. Yeah. And when you understand that it's happening in you, then everywhere you go, you understand I am a divine seed. So everywhere I go, I'm a seed in the ground. I'm a seed on my job. I'm a seed in my neighborhood. I'm a seed in my family. And through the seed of God's sacramental power, life begins to emerge. Now, I'm not one of these people who feel the need to erase the struggle of the inconsistency of how does this work in the context when we see ugliness wickedness and war 
genocide, racism, white supremacy, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, capitalism, all these isms that are literally trying to erase the Imago Dei, the image of God in creation. How do I respond if God is giving me supernatural grace within my struggle? How do I reconcile everything that is telling us the opposite? Well, I want you to know, beloved, that this is why the practice of training yourself to see Jesus becomes so important. Because even through the biblical text, the presence of God did not erase human struggle. It did not remove the faithful out of the harm's way of their enemies. But it gave them the strength to face wickedness and not lose their humanity. I wonder, beloved, what's at stake for my first point if you believe that seeing Jesus allows you to see the reflection of God's glory? That Jesus is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. The Jewish writers reading this text had all kind of assumptions about the limitation of Jesus. Being who Jesus claimed he was. How can you claim to be the uncreated one? And yet I'm looking at you walking up and down the streets of Galilee. How can you claim to be the king of kings and the lord of lords and the emperor just put you on a cross? How can I reconcile the dissonance? Lord, if I had more time to talk about dissonance, I'd read some friends for none, but I'm running out of time. Dissonance of my life, our world, and the claims of God. I want you to know, beloved, that Sometimes seeing Jesus within the ugliness of creation helps us to uncouple the expressions and beliefs about God that were handed to us that we did not fully interrogate. How many of you know that there's some things I was told about God as a kid that I didn't necessarily interrogate? I had the tools to interrogate it. I was told, don't question God, you know, whatever you, and you know, often God was mediated through the preacher. It was more often than not a man. And I ain't, I'm, all, I'm a man, so you know, ain't, ain't nothing, you know, devaluing about that. How many of you know that not everything you were told about God when you was a child, or dare I say even when you were an adult, is to be held without interrogation. That's it. Argue. You got Christians Come on. in this country who believe it is their responsibility to set up a theocracy through their limited white supremacist That's lens it. That's it. and want to use the violence of the state to force all of us to live under it. That's right. You know, I tell people all the time, you know, there's certain things that, I, you know, all of our theologies may not fully kind of line up with. That's okay. Do you not know how diverse the Christian tradition is? I was speaking with someone last night, and she was, you know, upset about Israel, Palestine. She's like, you know, I just don't understand how anyone can be a Christian and be, be, a, part, uh, be a part of that, so I'm just going to leave the church. I said, well, wait a second. I mean, you want to leave the church? I, you know, hey, I understand. Sometimes I be want to leave the church, too, but thank God for the way. <laughs> I don't want to leave y'all because I feel like we're a good church. But some of these churches out here, I'd be like, Lord, can you change your name? Like, don't call yourself the church. Call yourself uh, vomit from the pit of hell. I don't know. Call, call, call yourself something else. But I told her, I said, you know, just because you see a, what I would argue, poor expression of Christian faith, why leave the whole tradition? It makes me know that you have not read. And why would you? How would you? Because it's a lot of books. Do you not know the biggest Christian 
Theological Library west of the Mississippi is right up there at the GTU. You go in there and you can get lost in some books. I'm talking about lost. And you can read all of it and still not capture the richness of a tradition that produces pacifists, anti-imperialists, folk who are literally dismantling systems. And you still got some folk in there who was owning slaves and, and dominating and domineering the world. So in the tradition, you find diversity. Hook up with a faithful expression. I would argue faithful expression. But we must interrogate our faith. I see Jesus in my faith by interrogating. So what is your faith in Jesus teaching you about God? First question. Are there assumptions about God you must unlearn? Listen, as you encounter Jesus more deeply. I just want you to know, beloved, that in our tradition, we believe that the way I learn about the uncreated one is through the life of Jesus. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our, our example. Jesus is the one who we believe came to earth to show us the way. Embodied through the incarnation, the fullness of God in human body. Lord have mercy, my time is gone. And these sacramental moments, we used to sing a song when folks getting ready to get baptized. God's going to trouble the water. It was more than going in wet, dry devil, wet devil. No. We believe a sacramental moment happens that the waters of baptism, sacramentalized by the Holy Spirit, does a supernatural work in the willing as you get baptized. The taking of the bread and the wine, it's just bread and wine until the Spirit touches it and it becomes a sacramental expression yes. of God infusing in you through the water or through the communion grace and you know these other 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 ones that I I, I, I didn't get a chance to go over because I'm just out of time I, I, I just want you to know in every one of these sacramental uh, moments uh, of, of the other ones they, they say penance and reconciliation I mean, oh, there's, there's a supernatural gift when you make restitution for the wrongs you've done. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you don't do nothing. Well, all right, well, I don't know. I'm sorry, and then you get on your hands and knees and you try to recreate that which you destroy. Supernatural grace gets extended to you. Reconciliation. I had to reconcile with some people this week with tears and great energy. I had to go take a nap. It was, it was a lot. But when I got up, I felt like I had more grace. The anointing of the sick. Lord, have mercy. Marriage, holy orders, all of these things, sacraments. And beloved, when you get to a place where you start to realize that I need more of God so I can see God everywhere. Then I'm willing to do the work. Some of this requires work. There is a practice of faith that is labor free. And I believe you will still get the benefits. That's how rich God's grace is to us. But anybody ever met someone that you know had a rich spiritual life? I know you do because, you know, it's easy. Like, you be needing prayer and you don't call everybody. How I many you don't call your club friends when you need prayer? <laughs> you know they Christian like you. <laughs> You don't call your smoking friends when you need prayer. You know they're a Christian like you. It's no judgment. But when you need, I'm talking about a prayer like you don't need to hit the ceiling, come back to the ground. You, I need somebody to get a hold of God. Come on now. You got a short list. Yes. Those folk are 
doing the work to see Jesus. And it is not an exclusive club. I want you to know, beloved, practicing the presence of God, having a consistent fellowship with God. I appreciate our Muslim brothers and sisters who practice this prayer time multiple times a day. They don't care where they at. You and other, it's more pronounced in other countries. Here in the United States, I don't know what we be happening in our faith here in the United States. You can be a religious person in this country and they'll just drag it all out of you. Just make it into something else. You know, other places, folks just roll their mat out, be, be just anywhere. But, oh, well, you, yeah, you, 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 you get in touch with the Lord. Well, Allah, God bless you. That's great. I want the way you, us, we, the church in this season, see Jesus. Amen. Let me correct it. I want us to do see Jesus. Come on. To do the work. So you can see Jesus wherever you are. I may be going through tough circumstances. I may be dealing with pain and suffering. I didn't get to this in my text because I'm just out of time. We got to baptize. We got to do communion. But in your most difficult seasons doing the work to see Jesus unlock supernatural grace for you some people say oh you're just doing mind tricks well if that's what you got to tell yourself but beloved there's nothing like divine strength in your weakest moments there's nothing like divine healing when every doctor has given you up. There's nothing like deliverance when other folk walk away from you because you're such a hopeless cause. You call whatever you want to call it. But there's a difference between your self-help work and training yourself to see Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the divine reflection of God's glory with an imprint of God's essence and if that's true and I believe it is when I see God I see presence of God's image even amongst the evil of this world when death happens I don't become numb to the death of others. Because God is not numb to the death of others. When I see calamity and poverty and injustice, because I see Jesus, the reflection of God's glory and the imprint of the divine essence, then I become an extension of God in the world. And beloved, I need us in this season to be more like God in this world. Not, 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 not the reflection of the devil, the retributive, punitive, hateful, death-dealing devil that all of us are being socialized to be. Be okay with war. You can't be a faithful follower of the Lord and be okay with war. You just can't. And even if the politicians you're going to vote for are okay with it, you can't be okay with it. You got to speak up. Your favorite mayor, your favorite district attorney, your favorite whoever. God needs a people to see Jesus and reflect it. Come on, stand to your feet. I, I, Lord, I wish I had more time. Maybe I got to preach that part too. Grab the hand of someone next to you if you don't mind. Come across the aisle, please. Come across the aisle. Let's everybody touch somebody if you don't mind. Hallelujah. God, I touch my beloved today as an extension of you. Lord, you know every trial, every circumstance, every difficulty, you know their hearts ache. You know, God, the issues that they are contending with. 
I pray that they will train themselves to see you, God. To see the manifested presence of you, God. Even amongst the tears they cry, the questions they raise, the struggles they endure, may you show up in ways that are undeniable so they can see you, God. Give them your strength. Give them your peace. Give them your salvation. Give them more of you. In the name of Jesus, defeat the enemy's plans in their life today. Every strategy that the enemy has, may it fall to the ground. Every sickness that is overtaking their body, may it cease right now in the name of Jesus. Every dysfunction, God, every, Lord God, attack, every division, every, every malice, every act that is not a reflection of your glory. I pray, God, today for my neighbor who I'm touching, I pray, God, that you will give them a supernatural encounter with you. I know, God, it doesn't take long and it doesn't take much to make a believer out of us. So I pray right now, God, that you will do it in Jesus' name. Break these yokes, oh God. Loose these chains and make it, God, a testimony. Lift your hands now, God, it's me and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it is not my father, it is not my sister, it's not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Say it again, I need you, Lord. I need you, God, to visit my circumstance. Visit my circumstance. Visit my home. Visit my relationship. Visit my body. Visit my neighborhood. Visit my political situation. Visit the global situation. Visit East Oakland. Visit West Oakland. Visit Hunter's Point. Visit uh, the Iron Triangle. Visit Palestine. Visit Beirut. Visit Jerusalem. Visit the Sudan. Visit Haiti. Visit God the Panama. Visit Brazil. Visit God everywhere. Asia, China, Taiwan. Visit us, God, in the midst of our challenges. And God, infuse us with a sacramental gift, a supernatural gift, so I can see what eyes have not seen. Uh, shut up. I can hear what ears have not heard. I can have an imagination that expands what's entered into the heart. And I pray, God, you will do something brand new. God, we pray for the waters of baptism that are troubling right now. May your spirit hover the waters, God. May the souls that are getting ready to step foot in the water, God, may they be willing to experience a sacramental experience. We that are about to receive the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may it God be for us grace that we need for the facing of this hour. And we'll say thank you, Lord. We'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Give a neighbor a high five. Give him a hug. Tell him I do see Jesus. Tell him that. I do see Jesus. I do see Jesus. I do see Jesus.